I love when coaches, consultants, and professional service providers want to do big things in their business. They want to rise to the top and influence their market and the world around them. They want to have a greater impact and make a more lucrative income. Well, if this is you, welcome to Expert in You Podcast, the show where I interview other experts and coaches, consultants, so that they can share their success strategies with you. We're going to talk about marketing and how to close more sales, how to get more premium clients, and how to really build your visibility in the market and scale your business like a boss. If this is you, welcome to the show. I want to ask you to subscribe and hit the notification bell right now so you you don't miss one episode. Grab your coffee and buckle up because we are ready to give it all to you to help you become the expert and get paid as the expert that you are. Hi, everyone. I want to welcome you back to another episode of Expert in You Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Carden, and I have a really special guest today. As you can see, he is a physician. He's sitting there with his... Um, lab coat on and his stethoscope, but he is a pediatric physician. So Vladimir Bayerov, Bayer, I know I'm not saying that right, so I'm going to let you say it. Welcome to my show. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is a little bit difficult to pronounce. It's Vladimir Baryev. Baryev, Baryev, and he even told me that and I still messed it up. So, uh, but I'm so excited to, to interview you because you are doing just some incredible things. We are going to be talking about the next big disruptor in the health and medical field. And I'm really excited to interview him about something that he's doing out there uh, with his practice that is, I, I think it's very cutting edge. It's probably been around for a lot of years, but it's now really starting to become a little bit more mainstream. And so first, before we get started, um, Dr. Bayerov, Bayerov. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Vladimir, I could say that one. You can say Dr. Vlad. That's great. Too. Okay, Dr. Vlad. Do your patients have this much trouble saying your last name too? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, so I have them call me Dr. Vlad. Oh, there we go. Okay, Dr. Dr. Vlad. Vlad. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So you are doing some, some great things out there, but I want to really talk about what, first of all, a little bit of your backstory and why you got into medicine and why in particular pediatrics. And then I also want to talk about what you're doing in your practice that really is disrupting um, the health and medical field. So I'm just going to give you the mic and let you let you share. Thank you so much for that. So my name is Dr. Vladimir Baryev, and uh, let me take you back to the beginning. So I was born in a uh, Central Asian country called Uzbekistan in the former Soviet Union. I came to the U.S. with my family uh, when I was four years old. Uh, so I most of my childhood was spent uh, in New York City. And uh, I was always uh, curious and fascinated by science as a child. It was always something interesting to me. You know, a lot of doctors have this story that some major health event happened that triggered them uh, into becoming a physician. For me, it wasn't so much a single event. Um, my mother was a physics teacher. Uh, my father was a musician. Uh, and somehow I ended up going into the medical field. I didn't follow anyone in any family business uh, style or orientation. But... Uh, when I was a child, I had a great experience with my pediatrician. I thought he was very patient, uh, very uh, kind and loving, and felt like he enjoyed his life. He always had pictures of his own kids on his walls. He seemed like a nice family man. Like This was like a good role model for someone I would like to be uh, when I grew up. And then as I learned more uh, about medicine and healthcare, I became more and more interested in it. Uh, in society, we... Uh, we say that uh, medicine is a calling, that it's just something that you feel like you're drawn to do to help people, try to heal people. Um, and my grandparents, my parents were always telling me from a young age, like, yeah, you have you have that something about your personality that you, you're, you're um, compassionate, you care about people, you want to help to see them get better. Um, so that is how I ended up pursuing uh, medicine. Um, and then I went to medical school and uh, first I went to undergraduate medical school, um, did my residency all here in the wonderful state of New York. So I was very fortunate because sometimes uh, in life you get uh, taken uh, to different states, different cities when you're going through medical training. Uh, we're, we're at the mercy of the medical match or wherever 
uh, whatever residency matches uh, with your application, that's where you're going to end up going. For myself, I completed my medical school uh, and uh, college education. Uh, I want to give a big shout out to uh, the CUNY School of Medicine. Uh, mm -hmm. When I was there, it was called the Sophie Davis School of Biomedical Education. It was a very selective program. They would take 90 uh, top performing high school students in New York City, and they would give them an accelerated as opposed to an eight year uh, college and medical school. They combined it and made it into a seven year um, direct path. Oh. And the final two years of my training, I did at New York Medical College, a very historic institution uh, in Westchester, New York where I lived for a couple of years. And then I did my residency uh, in Queens in uh, what was called a Cohen's Children's Hospital. It still is called Cohen Children's Hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, they are currently under the name of Northwell Health. Um, and then I worked, I had my first two jobs were with a, um, a general pediatrics practice or was mostly Medicaid, mostly uh, Spanish-speaking patients in Hamilton Heights uh, and near Harlem in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And then I worked there for about three years. Then I uh, did an additional two years um, working on Staten Island because uh, my family moved uh, so that I can uh, have children and start raising my children near um, their grandparents who live on Staten Island. And after two years on Staten Island, um, or working at a federally qualified health center, once again, with um, mostly families on Medicaid, um, mm -hmm. many Spanish speaking families. I um, felt like I, I knew enough about the system that uh, I was ready to start uh, my own practice. And I opened up my own office uh, in 2021. Okay, perfect. I love it. And um, I I had to smile when I first interviewed him because I saw his videos on Facebook and I said, you're on TikTok, aren't you? Because yeah, <laughs> he can get away with it because he is in pediatrics, right? And so it, it fits with the whole kid thing, but um, fun videos that he puts out there that, that really show his expertise as well. So I love this. And what made you decide to, I mean, owning your, having your own practice is very different from working in, you know, in health and medical in a hospital. What made you decide to go into your own practice? Because it's not just practicing, right? It's business and it's marketing and it's sales, all of those things. So what, what made you decide to go the entrepreneur's path? So from the very beginning, I think once I finished my residency and I saw how um, primary care doctors work, especially primary care pediatricians, mm -hmm. uh, I noticed a pattern of uh, the visits were very short and, uh, and roughly like five or 10 minute visits. Uh, even the well visits, they weren't very long. Mm -hmm. And uh I would hear that the families, they weren't particularly satisfied uh, with having such short visits to, to the doctor. Uh, and uh, the more years that I had of experience, uh, the more I realized this is not really a sustainable model of care that we're providing to people. Like when someone, my idealistic view of a doctor uh, was in those, in those old black and white movies when we would see doctors uh, come to someone's <laughs> home and take care of kids when they got sick or sit down with someone for half an hour to an hour to discuss uh, their issues. It was a much more close personal one-on-one -on -one relationship. And when I actually started practicing, on average, New York doctors see 30 kids in a single day. Uh, that dilutes the amount of attention you can give to each child. Right. And also it affects the quality of care that you can give them. And they notice it. They notice it. Sure. Right? There's no way it cannot do that, right? No way. There, the quality is not the same. It's. Uh, I learned this actually from one of my business mentors. He said, there are three things that you can, and, and it applies to medicine too. There's three things. You can either have it fast, you can have it cheap, or you can have it really good. You can have two <laughs> of the three, you can't have all three. That's true. That not not a truer statement. Um, yeah. So one of the things I mean, when you think about there, I can't even imagine coaching 30 clients a day. That would be the most exhausting. I think by day two, I would be finished. And this but this really is what physicians are experiencing out there. They are burning out. 
they're exhausted. They're not, the patient care isn't there and they know it. And so that's another stressor that they have as well, but it really is almost like herding people through like cattle. And I think you had told me that insurance really only allows them 15 minutes per patient. Is that, yeah, that's pretty is that much right? what happened? Yeah, that's pretty much what happened. Ever since um, the HMO revolution and mm-hmm. uh, the way that insurance companies have been reimbursing for care, the the objective has been about volume medicine, mm-hmm. right. about uh, quality of care. Um, there we have um, middlemen in the system where they say, "Oh, don't worry about paying your doctor. Well, all you have to do is pay us." And we'll worry about dispersing the funds. Well, when they disperse the funds for you on your behalf, they're doing it with their best interests in mind because right. they have to meet their bottom line. They have their profit agendas that they have to make. Their their primary interest it has nothing to do with what I learned to do in, in medical school, which was to take care of people the right way that they need to be taken care of. Right. Uh, time and attention. There's no substitute for spending time with your patients. There is none. Uh, no matter how much uh, technology you add, no matter how many check boxes you add into the electronic medical records, check off here if your two-year-old is a smoker or not. Like these kind of silly things that they, that they <laughs> these little um, uh, carrots that they put uh, on a stick to make sure that you get reimbursed for the visit. Uh, the focus right now in healthcare is that doctors have to focus on billing and coding properly so they can get reimbursed for the visit that they've seen. So they spend more time in front of the computer which is ironic because we're in front of a computer now. Uh, more time in front of a computer <laughs> for than a good actually, reason for a good yes. reason, yes. <laughs> than actually face to face with patients. Like we become, right? Um, we become just data entry clerks, pretty much yes. uh, as physicians. That's a lot of schooling to be a data entry clerk, isn't it? It's is a lot of school to be a data entry clerk. <laughs> yes, um, definitely not what you signed up for and where your passion is. And of course, you can get someone to do it for you, but you still have to oversee that. You still have to be involved to make sure that that's being done properly and managing that process. And again, that, um, yes, I, I I know that's not what people go to medical school for and not, not the area that they want to spend most of their time. So what you have done, what you're doing is something that I'm starting to see in a lot of specialties uh, with physicians. And that is they're going to a concierge service or they're going to a direct primary care service. And that is exactly what you have done in your practice. And so I would love for you to share what that really means and what is the value of that to people um, and why they should maybe seek someone doing concierge service or uh, direct primary care versus going through the the traditional health and medical channels. Do you want to talk about that? I would love to. I figured you would. (laughs) (laughs) I would love to. Absolutely. So yeah, when we mentioned earlier that the the typical doctor, typical pediatrician is seeing about 30 patients in a day, you have to keep in mind that doesn't leave a lot of time for very much else. It doesn't leave a lot of time for uh, double checking uh, each patient's record and following up on things. It, mm-hmm. it puts the onus on the, on the families and the patients uh, to to get back to us to follow up on certain things. So what ends up happening is that at the end of the day, once you're that thirtieth patient, or once you once the office is closed at five, what what you can't reach the doctor. They're exhausted. They're burnt out. They, they've used up all their um, energy for that day. You can't blame them. They're only human, right? Right. So what ends up happening? Urgent care centers pop up everywhere you look around. You there's an urgent care center. Why? Because primary care doctors that that know the families that have relationship with the families cannot see them because they're busy running the third. Now, how right. do they end up having end up seeing thirty patients a day? Well, with insurance, what ends up happening with these practices is that you, like you said, you can hire someone to do the billing for you. You can hire someone to take vital signs for you. You can hire someone uh, to be at, at your front as you can hire someone to do a lot of different things. What that does is it increases your overhead. Yes. So if for each person you hire, you have to pay their salaries. Now, how do you pay a salary? You have to see more patients. That's how we ended up in the mess of 30 pay. So uh, we need, uh, what I realized is that we have to get back to the, the simplified, simple days of direct doctor and patient relationships without having all these extra bells and whistles with all these additional overhead and costs involved. That's um, that's what drew me to this model. And I wasn't the one who invented direct primary care. I, I stand on the shoulders of giants who have come before me in family medicine and in pediatrics who have um, done this type of model before. 
So the way that this practice works is instead of seeing your regular doctor uh, when they're available, if you can get an appointment for right. the 15, the five to 15 minute visit uh, with the visit being so short that on average, they'll interrupt you every 11 seconds that you're trying to tell them what's wrong with you. You know, the alternative to it is what I'm trying to do is I let family speak because we have either 15 minutes, 30 minutes to an hour for our appointments. Everything is by appointment. So families call or text me and let me know that they would like to be seen on a particular day. And I always make sure to accommodate them to be seen within a reasonable time frame. Um, and we talk through their issues. I give them uh, anticipatory guidance. I tell them, okay, your child has this cough or a nose. Be aware that they may have high fevers over the next couple of days. And here's what you're going to do as a contingency plan for all that. Mm-hmm. Explaining all these contingencies and things takes time. So I take the time. I make sure to explain it that way that when they're out of the office, if, if they do come up with a question, uh, they say, oh, yeah, we addressed that during the visit. Or if it wasn't addressed, the amazing benefit I give to them is that anything we didn't address during our up to one hour visit with me here, you have my direct cell number to reach me 24 hours a day and ask me, hey, doc, this wasn't so clear to me. Can you please clarify or can you tell me what I should do if I see this, this and this? Um, so that's the access. That's the number yes. one benefit for families to joining concierge direct care is that access. Because without that access, here's what ends up happening. You, you, you call the office. Oh, I'm sorry. We're not able to see you for two weeks. Oh, that's, that's not going to work because I'm sick right now. I need to be seen. Or, okay, we can see you today. So you go over mm-hmm. for the visit, the five-minute visit. User, and then you call, oh, I have a follow-up question. Oh, okay, the doctor will get back to you when they're available. Sometimes they'll call Oh, you and back. they never do. Oh, Sometimes let me just don't. tell you. No, they never do. I feel like the majority of people are telling me that they don't get calls back. I know no. doc- some doctors who do call back, even though they're very, very busy, they make it on, but that's not the majority. That's the minority of doctors. And that's if you can even get in to see the doctor that y- you've been seeing forever. You know, I, I have a doctor I've been seeing for many, many, many years. And all of a sudden, the last time I made an appointment, I couldn't even see him anymore because he's so full of patients. And it was days before I could even see anyone at all. And so that is exactly what your host process and what your what your care and what your private practice really eliminates. And in it's less wait times too, right? Absolutely. So there's there's no wait times. If, if you have a scheduled appointment at nine o'clock, I tell you, I will have my stethoscope on your child's chest by 905. That's just the way it works. And that's not an exaggeration. That's actually how it works. People uh, have told me there's no way that can happen. Like, yes, there is a way it can happen. If you or I know the families, I know how long uh, some families would like to spend with me and, and how little other families want, want to uh, talk to me. And I schedule it accordingly uh, based on knowing these families individually and their personalities. And also having access to me after hours uh, does, does not make the visits last as long as, uh, as, as otherwise would be because they'll come in with a long list of things that, that weren't right. addressed or to prepare. Um, so, so you get a call to, or you get a text or a call to in the morning and you answer that, you know, believe it or not, I, I will, you I probably will. Uh, don't the, even get them. Do you over Unless, the past two years, I have been called once. Wow. Only once over the past two years it's because, uh, when you have that close relationship, when they know that they can access me when they need me, uh, right. emergencies don't come up that often. The most common emergencies that I will hear in the middle of the night are, um, a, a croupy child with a, with a barky sounding cough, um, or a baby who has a fever. Uh, those are the those are the two types of, of after hours calls that I would get, and those wouldn't even be in the middle of the night. It would be like at seven or eight p.m. ish. Um, right, right. So, how does primary care work then? Do you still bill insurance? I know there is a membership fee, and we're going to talk about that. But is insurance still billed for things or what's covered, what's not covered? So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So since the quality of care is very different, it's hard to directly compare it. It's like comparing apples to oranges, because in my case, when you see a direct primary care doctor, you have so much access that urgent care centers are not part of your vocabulary. You don't need an urgent care center. Uh, because your doctor is available to you. Your doctor can give you the advice that it's needed. And um, you never know who's staffing an urgent care center, how what their level of experience is. Right. It's not the same person who's 
uh, had 10 years of experience working with children as a, as a, as a pediatrician after I finished medical school back in 2012. I've, I've been doing this for 10 years now. So I have seen, unfortunately, uh, some significant errors, medical errors occur for families that have to rely on other means and not their own uh, doctor. Mm -hmm. So the quality is, is, first, the quality is much higher, right? You get, right. you know that the person you're going to see is going to get a great visit because it's your doctor. That's one. So then comes down, it comes down to the cost. Typical family will have about, uh, with, with using health insurance has had deductibles, the fancy famous mm -hmm. word of deductibles. They end up paying about $3,000 a year in, in their deductibles. Uh, that's what the average uh, family that, that I've seen uh, have shown me. I charge um, less than that deductible amount. So just think about how unfair the system is. You're paying each month, but if you're going to use a doctor, you also have to pay a copay and a deductible. Right. Right. Go, right. So the copays are like $50. It uh, mm -hmm. can be as, as up to as $50 or more uh, to see the doctor. So my, instead of dealing with all that, I do not bill through insurance for my services directly. I have a monthly membership uh, that families mm -hmm. pay sustainable price, sustainable for both them, uh, they, they're able to afford it, and sustainable for myself that I'm able to keep lights on in my office. Uh, and it's uh, $100 per month uh, on average for a child. That includes um, all the visits that they'll get with me and all the calls and on top of all that, I'm even able to make house calls uh, because there are some families since COVID mm -hmm. don't want to bring their kids outside, understandably, right. uh, especially newborns. So I'm, I'll make a home visit for a newborn. Wow, I didn't even realize that. So that that's I had no extra charge. It's included with the, with the fee. Uh -huh. I get to do a lot of additional services that would not be otherwise possible if I was seeing 30 kids a day. Right, right. It, it sounds like it's just a lot more fulfilling practice too, because you get to do what you really signed up for and what you really went to all that schooling for. And so the burnout rate is a lot less with this type of a model. Is that right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I've been in a group with other physicians around the country. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a Facebook group and we discuss, uh, and they're all owners of direct primary care practices. Uh -huh. And we discuss um, questions and issues and we support each other. And they're all unbelievably happy that they've made this change in their lifestyle. And they're no longer working for an insurance company, but rather working directly for the patients themselves and doing right. whatever is in their best interest and best need. If there's something that's uh, additional fluff or unnecessary overhead. They just opt not to do it and just focus on what people actually need to stay healthy. Right. So where do you see this going? Uh, because I, I'm seeing this more and more where I didn't know about it even a couple of years ago. I am seeing this more and more across the country. Uh, these direct primary cares and concierge services popping up and more and more physicians going this route. Where do you see the future of medicine. This definitely is a disruptor in, in the health and medical field. Um, yeah. What, what, what is your thought there? The future is bright. I mean, everyone who's come into my office, they say they cannot believe um, how amazing it is to come in and to be seen and to be heard mm -hmm. and to have this high uh, quality of care. So they're just seeing the difference uh, of experience, just the overall experience, uh, the ambiance that you get with a, a direct care office. Uh, so the future looks wonderful that it's going to continue to grow. You know, I have several reasons to believe that it will continue to grow. So, so the number of doctors has expanded to over 1,000 in the direct primary care arena okay. uh, around the country. And uh, the look at our current medical system, and a percentage of how much people, just basic economics, right? Uh, as a percentage of how much people uh, make um, with their salaries, medical expenses are rising every single year uh, relative crazy. to how much money people are earning. And that's cutting into their earnings because their employers, instead of paying them more of a salary, have to pay more for their health insurance. Right. People right. have to realize at the end of the day, they, by continuing this trend, by 
keep having these uh, inflated unfair costs rising and rising every year after year, and your deductibles rising and rising year after year. Right. co pays rising and rising year. After year. At some point, people are going to just say, why, are, why do we even bother with this? Why can't we have it the same way that what's happening in the auto industry right now, where I have car insurance. Everyone has to have car insurance, but I don't use my car insurance to fill up my gas. I don't use my car insurance to change my windshield wipers. Those are affordable fees that I can pay out of pocket and I keep my deductible for my car insurance very affordable as well. We should do the same thing with healthcare. Primary care, you pay it out of pocket directly to your doctor. And then uh, for catastrophic care, if you get into an accident or something horrible happens, you need right. to be hospitalized. You have a catastrophic emergency plan that comes in. That's not that expensive because you're not using it for routine things. Right. No, I agree. I, I think people are um, I, I know more and more people are just not even carrying insurance because it's just so ridiculous, especially if you are somewhat healthy and you don't use it a lot. It just it's just money going out that you just can't justify. Of course, people keep it for that main, like you said, something that's catastrophic or some and a major emergency that you didn't anticipate. But I think more and more people are really kind of waking up and saying this isn't. I don't want to invest in this anymore. It's just not really worth it. So I love, I love, love, love that other things are coming up and and they really are disrupting the health and medical. And like you said, at some point, people have to just say enough is enough, right? Because who is, you see hospitals that are struggling and you hear that all the time because things are so outrageous, but yet who is getting paid the money? It's the insurance companies, right? It's that middle, that middle man. Uh, they I'm also glad you said it and not me. Yeah, I, I said it. I said it. So they, they're not going to come after me. So, <laughs> um, so one thing that I, I really want to um, hit on with this as well is you feel like um, if you have, well, let me just, let me think about this for a minute. So if you have a child that has something that's more on an emergency basis, how is that handled? Because they're paying a membership fee and that's covering their their main care. But how is all of that handled? Like if they need to be hospitalized or go to an emergency room or something like that? Yes. So in those cases, I tell all my families, listen, I will provide you with 90% of the health care that you need as, as a primary care doctor, which 90% of the time I can do what you can even minor emergencies like needing stitches. Uh -huh. I can, okay. you know, needing splints for a fractured bone. I can put a splint for a fractured bone. Those basic things I can do. Now, there will be some things, of course, that are out of my control. I am not a heart surgeon. Right. I am not able to repair uh, an eyeball injury, for example. So uh -huh. for those things, I do tell them every family, I highly strongly recommend have health insurance for catastrophic things. That doesn't mean you have to get the most expensive insurance, but you have to have right. something cover you for uh, the additional expenses of a subspecialist care. Okay. Okay. No, I, that's, that's perfect. What else would you like to talk about that we maybe didn't cover that you would like to, for people to know? Or have we covered most of it? I think. I think we covered most of it. Uh, if I could think of anything else to add to our conversation. So we talked about accessibility quality of care, mm -hmm. uh, the direction of healthcare in this country. Even wait uh, times. Wait <laughs> times, you talk about wait times. That's a big one. It's about the house calls. Oh, uh -huh. there's, one, there's one thing. All right, here we go. Physicians as leaders. So because doctors have had to be uh, so overworked with, especially in the primary care field, with seeing patients, it restricts their ability to do things outside of uh, the clinic. What, what am I talking about? Mm. So my example, personally. So to me, as a pediatrician, what I see a lot of obesity, asthma, autism, those three, if I, if I only know about those three illnesses, I would be able to help 90% of the kids that I, that I see on a daily basis. Mm. Right? So Childhood obesity is my number one existential threat to the children in this country who become adults in this country. Mm -hmm. The management of childhood obesity, uh, I feel, is has not gotten the attention that it deserves. I think in primary care, uh, we can learn the strategies if given enough time. 
because it is a time intensive process. If given enough time in primary care, we can help uh, impact the childhood obesity epidemic. Not alone because there, there are environmental factors involved, of course, but beside being in the clinic, advocating for our families and for myself, writing books about the subject, which is I'm in the middle of writing a book about right. you did uh, say addressing yes. childhood obesity. So being able to work in direct primary care helps that restore mm-hmm. that role of a physician as a leader in the community, no longer just someone in the clinic, but as a leader, as a voice for us, because we're on the ground and we're seeing what right. disease is doing to people, how it's ravaging their lives, how it's harming them, how being, uh, how having diabetes, how having heart disease is affecting adults uh, and even some children, unfortunately, these days. Uh, we need to speak out because the only change we're gonna get into this system is a change that we bring about to ourselves. We have to create a schedule for ourselves and a lifestyle for ourselves that gives us enough margin to be able to, uh, to, to be leaders. And so, because we have so much training, so much education and so much right. experience face to face with people, we have to use that. We have to use that pl- as a, and make a platform to speak out on issues that uh, we find are wrong in society. Because as of today, the ones with the loudest voice are the ones with the most money, which are large corporations, uh, right. food and beverage corporations, insurance corporations. They have the largest right. voice, they have a large platform. Well, they don't have the public trust as, as we do. That's true. And I want to preserve the public trust. I don't want the public to see me as an employee of an insurance company yeah. uh, doing their bidding on their behalf. No, I want them to see me as an employee for them, for the common good. I am here to serve first and foremost. And by restoring that, that trust and relationship, we may even help us and besides um, obesity care, uh, childhood immunization rates, mm-hmm. which are far too low uh, relative to where they were even 20 years ago. Mm. So, it, and that to me is a factor of trust that if, if you're spending five minutes, there's no way you can counsel a family on the true risks and benefits of uh, immunization in kids. What ends up happening, right. Dr. Google gives them that advice of whether or not right. 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 that is the wrong doctor to tell you how to make healthcare decisions. I love that you're talking about this because like you said, you have to have a voice and and being that voice in the community. But the other thing I really love that you're talking about is, is trying to be proactive versus reactive. And I think we are in a reactive society. Everything is uh, so everyone reacts. Nobody does the proactive care that needs to be done. Insurance companies do not reward wellness. They don't reward that. They, it's all about, you know, you, you come when you're sick, you come when there's something wrong. And I really think until we reverse that, we're going to struggle being, it's so crazy. We have supposedly the best healthcare in the entire world. And yet we are the most unhealthy country, I believe in the whole world, or we're right up there at the top. And that just shows you the shift that really needs to happen and needs to take place in healthcare and in the medical field. That is a hundred percent correct. We have the most expensive health. We pay the, the highest price and our results are meh at best. Yes. Yeah. So I absolutely love what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you for your service and for what you are doing and, and taking a step back. I mean, one of the things, because I'm a business coach and consultant, one of the things that I asked him, I said, is this is profitable because at the end of the day, people are concerned with profits and especially in business and all of that. And one of the things you shared with me is it's not quite in most cases as profitable, but it's close and you, you feel fulfilled and you don't burn out. And, and so why do you think more physicians are not going this route? I just want to kind of end with this. What, what do you think is the, the hold back there? So it has to do with a number of factors. I'll, I'll go through the, the, the number of factors, why most physicians don't do it. Um, the number one factor, of course, it applies to business just as, uh, as it applies to, to medicine, role models, right? So since this, there's still a shortage of role models of people who are doing this successfully, that number is growing every day. Right. Uh, thankfully, for, for the people who came before me, I thank them all. Um, the, the one is seeing a role model do it. Number two is 
uh, the medical student debts uh, for that. So we are in golden handcuffs. Mm. And the last thing on our mind is ha- taking on more debt to open right. a practice because medical students at these days for a typical graduate is about $300,000 before they have even earned their first paycheck as a doctor. Yes. So that is a huge burden and it that doesn't go away with you even uh, until you die pretty much. <laughs> it does right. you cannot foreclose on um you cannot uh you have your you cannot have go bankrupt out of those medical students that those are lifelong. Then um aside from role models and debts is just you it it is a pretty lucrative industry to to work in the insurance uh based model. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can make a very good profit a very good salary and if you especially if you choose to go into becoming a specialist and not in primary care because right. primary care is not really a sexy field uh they see doctors that are burned out they see doctors who are uh, not able to spend time with their with their patients they're not able to deliver high quality so it's viewed as a, a low uh career f- with respect to other doctors um so the combination of those factors uh i think is, is what makes uh, most uh, physicians have a hard time. And then the other thing is lifestyle inflation. Uh, so right. we're, we've sacrificed our entire twenties to learn medicine. We had to defer our joy and, uh, reward until we finish medical school. And, we were and then to say that you no, you can't, uh, live a, a lifestyle of a, a medical doctor, which is portrayed so vividly in the media, uh, which is far from reality in high cost of living areas. <laughs> Usually is, enough. right? Yeah. The the <laughs> more expensive your city is, the less uh, your doctor makes there as a primary care doctor. That's basically how it goes. Because every doctor wants to live there. So there's an abundance of supply. And uh-huh. so the demand is lower, so your salary is lower. Um, but but it, their lifestyle, they don't, you have to take a step back and say, I'm, I'm willing to accept a lower lifestyle for a few years to build up this practice. And that's a yeah. very hard thing to ask people. I, I understand that. I feel like we have peeked behind the curtain here, which has been really insightful. And I think it's just been really eye-opening to be able to see, number one, you know, doctors like you, like you said, you really kind of have stepped into something that isn't shiny at the very beginning. And it takes a lot to get going, but it's because you have such a belief system around it and you re- you are really in it for the good of what you what you became a doctor for. So that's so admirable. And I I really hope that we start seeing a shift, but, you know, doctors and physicians like you, I mean, you're blazing trails and I love it. Thank you so much. Now I'm happy your voice is holding out. You sound really great. Um, But I really want to thank you for this opportunity to come speak. I take every opportunity I can speak with as many different audiences as I can about this because, uh, a rising tide lifts all boats. If I succeed, Absolutely. I can help the next doctor succeed after me. If I, as, as long as I structure uh, the practice properly, as long as I provide the quality that people need, uh, I feel like this. Uh, I can, we can continue going forward and the trend will continue to rise. How can people find uh, primary direct care physicians in their own local community? Because you're in New York, obviously you're not going to be able to help everyone, but how can people find these types of doctors? Because I don't, again, I don't think it's really well known. And that was one of the reasons I wanted you on here, because if I can help spread the word and I can help uh, people become aware that there is another way, then I want to be able to do that. So can you give us some insight on that? Fantastic question. Uh, so there is a doctor, his name is Phil SQ, who is also a lawyer. So he has a, double, a dual degree as he's a physician and he's also a lawyer. Uh, who created a website. He knows more about direct primary care than I think anyone I've ever spoken to in my life about the legalities of it, about uh, proper uh, ways of of billing patients with regard to uh, their different means of payments. He actually has a website with a map around the country where you can find a direct primary care office. And it is called the DPC Mapper. Uh, The name of his organization is DPC Frontier. And I believe their website is dpcfrontier.org. I can double check, verify that for you. Okay. And we'll put that, 
We'll put the link to that um, in the show notes. And we'll also put the links, his uh, Dr. Vlad's so, uh, social links, and you can follow him and his TikTok videos and his Facebook videos are fun. So we will put all of that with the show notes as well. So I cannot thank you enough. Um, one, one other quick question, though, that I just thought of, how long has this been around? Since at least, so there was, it wasn't called direct primary care in the beginning, but I believe since roughly the year 2005. Which isn't a really long, it's not, oh, 17 it's not years? a really long time. Uh-oh. Yeah. Less yeah. than 20 years. Okay. Okay. The great information. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for, uh, for your voice and for everything that you're doing in your community and in your practice. And I, you know, I'm so grateful. And I, I also love the wellness component that you're bringing to kids. There's such a need for that as well. So I'm, I'm a grandmother of triplets and uh, we just had a new, a new little one. So kids are just one of my passions. They're one of my missions. And um, so that was another reason I had to have you on here because I just have such a heart for kids. So we share that, we share that same drive, I think. Um, So thank you. I can't thank you enough for being here. This has been great. The light in me sees and appreciates light in you always. Namaste. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right, everyone. Until next time, I want to thank you so much for being here. And please, please share this. Get it out there. We need to show people there is a different way. Physicians like Dr. Vlad, they're blazing trails. They're standing up against something that needs to be uh, stood up against. And and so any way that we can help do that, uh, please do that. So thank you again. And until next time, everyone, you have an amazing day. And and God bless you. Bye-bye. If you've enjoyed this episode, I want to invite you to go check out a free training that I have at expertinu.us. It is a training that I have on how you can get ultra premium dream clients, scale your business, get more freedom, and really simplify your business and multiply your money. So go check that out. And again, that is expertinyou.us. I want to thank you for being here with me this week. I hope you found massive value. Please always leave a comment, feedback, or a question. We check them all. And I want you to go rock your business and make sure you join us again next week. God bless you. Have an amazing day. Bye-bye.